well, some, um, some, some remarks, some reflections on the relation between revolution and religion. Is religion revolutionary? Certainly it is. And certainly it is not. Undoubtedly, at times, religion got a major part in the political revolutions of its time. Today's history illustrates this perfectly. Think on Iran, Algeria, uh, Afghanistan, Somalia, and so on. On the other hand, however, it is undoubtedly true that most of the times religion is a major conservative factor in society's fight against revolutionary tendencies, which, in another way, goes for our time as well. Is religion revolutionary? It is too general, too vague question. If only because another difficult and abysmal question is working to the question whether um, religion is revolutionary or not. It is the question, so that question working to that first question, it is the question what, simple question, what religion is. What the hell is religion? It's a difficult question. Do we realize this question is not that simple? as so many definitions suppose. For if we answer this question by referring to belief or faith, which is a paradigm underlying the majority or maybe all religion definitions, we repeat a typically modern definition, characterized by problems of enlightenment, trying to find an answer to the regrettable finitude of our modern scientific knowledge. So, in answering the question, what is religion, we are talking about our own modernity, and not talking about religion. That which we are not able to scientifically know, we can have faith in. Thus, Immanuel Kant, as we know. Such faith is not doomed to be irrational, not at all. On the contrary, it is in fact a matter of reason. It's a kind of Vernunftglaube, to cite. Uh, count concerning that which we cannot know but on reasonable base believe in, in the rationality of the universe, in our own rationality, and its non contradiction to the human freedom and to the morality based on it. This is Kant. So the rational basis of religion, defined by Kant. But is this kind of belief, this kind of faith, is this the core, the kernel of religion? Facing, facing this problem, one must realize that the question of religion is indeed not simple. In a way, it's at least a double one, a double question. There are at least two kinds of religion. There is monotheism and there are the other religions. In other words, there is monotheistic and non-monotheistic religion. The religions we are dealing with on today's political and cultural scenes are all of the first type. In order to understand a bit more about the relation between the revolutionary, revolution and religion, we must comprehend what is at stake in that type, that monotheistic type of religion. And now I skip already, because all the way is my, my I, I, I skip the part of my text about the non-monotheistic religion, which is a difficult question. What the hell is that? The only thing I want to say here in, in, in the part I skipped is that we should realize we just don't know. We just don't know what non-monotheistic religion is because we are so influenced by monotheistic religion that we have no idea what the Romans in antiquity talked about when they talked about gods. To, to give a, 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 a few remarks, religion was not just a non-monotheistic religion and I refer to antiquity, to Greece, to Rome, religion was not a matter of truth or knowledge. That's the question. Truth was not involved. It was not about believing the truth of the adored gods. The gods were there. The gods were true. They were simply there, true in the eyes of the ones belonging to the people the gods belonged to. The truth was not the issue here. Gods simply were there. No one doubted about it. Each people had proper gods, and the gods of foreign people were not at all considered to be false.
to be false ones. When the Roman, just give an example, the, the example of what they call in, in Latin the evocatio, when the Romans decided to wage war against the people, they first of all seduced, really seduced by sacrifice, by rituals, they seduced the gods of those peoples, honored them with sacrifices, built them a home, a house, a temple in the city, in the woods, in Rome. Only when they knew the foreign gods felt accepted in the city, only were installed in the temple in the city, they went to battle against the foreign people concerned. So, gods were citizens. They were there. And you have to seduce them before conquering their people. Within the realm of those ancient religions, revolutions did certainly occur. But revolution was not paradigmatically inscribed in their practices and doctrines on the contrary. Those practices and doctrines were meticulously checked with respect to their conformity to the holy traditions and were meant to conserve not only these religious traditions but the people traditions in general. Monotheism is a radically different type of religion. At least what Jan Asman calls the exclusive kind of monotheism, which is precisely the one that had led the foundation of today's dominant religiosity. Though as traditional as any other religion, though fully meeting a people's intention to guarantee its transgenerational identity, monotheism nonetheless has something revolutionary in its core. Even merely historically, it has made its entrance by means of a general revolution. In the midst of the 14th century before Christ, the Egyptian pharaoh Amenhotep IV, better known as Akhenaton, carried through a radical religious reform and declared, almost, some, some, some discussion about it, but declared all ruling gods of his country to be false ones. The entire Egyptian pantheon, venerated from the very origin of the empire, was declared to be simply non-existent. This was revolutionary. Except one god, we know it, Atom. Akhenaton forbids all traditional cults and installed the only one and true religion of Atom, Sun Disks, the single god ruling the whole universe. Revolutionary was not only the radical social and cultural change Akhenaton forced the Egyptian society to, it implied a revolution on the level of religion on religion's principles as well. Introducing the distinction between true and false as a decisive criterion, it changed the very definition of religion. Now it was defined as a practice and doctrine worshipping its God because of his true status, because he was supposed to be the one and the only one who was a real God. For the first time in history, God's were declared to be an illusion, to be false, fake, non-existent. And to, to put it more clearly, for the first time, religion was criticized to its core for merely religious reasons. Here, criticism entered the very heart of religion, already in the 14th century before Christ. Religion became a matter of worshipping the truth, the true God or the godly truth. And this was to be done by criticizing the false gods and falsity as such. So we are not far away from the philosophical traditions. In a certain way, on the level of paradigms, it's the same. That's our problem. There is no real difference between thinking and religion. That's why, even in modernity, we cannot get rid of religion. That's our problem. That's, that, that's why the ghosts always appear because it's, it's, it's within criticism something of religion is persisting. And this um, distinguishing false from true, as in philosophy, as in thinking, as in Western thinking, distinguishing false from true became religion's very raison d'être. No longer was it a matter of commerce done by mortals in favor of the immortals they were dependent on and whose status was by definition 
unsure and obscure, these are the ancient gods, the, the pagan gods. No longer was it a matter of making deals with the ones beyond the limits of that, and who we needed in order to transmit ourselves, our lives, our identity, culture, etc., to the next generations and to give that procedure a strong tradition. Now religion became a matter of not missing the boat, of choosing for the right God and the true religion. The divine was no longer the domain of the immortal being living in the need of human gifts, sacrifices and prayers. The divine was one and indivisible and had the clarity of truth. His proper truth was sufficient for, his, for this one God. For human beings, it was a matter not of feeding these gods. This is ancient religion. You have to feed gods, otherwise they, they don't exist. No, it was not a matter of feeding gods. It was a matter of recognizing the truth of the one God. The, the, the truth embodied in that one God. But it is not a Kinetons religion that the kind of monotheism dominating history till now originates from. Our monotheistic religions are variations of the Hebrew Jewish monotheism, which is much younger, of much younger date. Similarly, um, that monotheism had a similar, a similar truth claim, a similar truth claim is central in, uh, mon in Jewish monotheism as it was in Akinetan's reform. The Jewish God is declared to be the only true one, at least for the Jews. Their God explicitly forbade them to worship other gods. In the beginning, they supposed these other gods were still possible, but very soon they declared them non existent as well. But unlike Akinetan's God, the Jewish God was not a cosmic one. Of course, the Jewish God was universal in the sense that he was the creator of the universe, but the core of that kind of monotheism was the pact of the one true God, the pact the one true God has made with the Hebrew people that he had saved from slavery in Egypt. In so, a certain way, the, the core of Jewish monotheism is political, it's not universal, it's not cosmical. The content of that religion is the covenant, as we know. Pact between God and his people. Pact speaking not so much about God in his divine realm as about how people should live together in a just way. It's about justice. The content of the covenant, that's what the descendants of Israel have to do in order to worship their God, is not so much maintaining a sacred commerce with the divine as to install justice within society. That's what still in modernity you are dealing with. To do justice to, and I, 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 I quote Exodus, Isaiah, and so on, to do justice to the widow and the orphan, to the stranger and the fatherless, as mentioned in Deuteronomy. This is what religion is about for the monotheism present in the Bible. Here, the political, the ethical law is directly linked to God and religion, which was not the case in Akinetan's monotheism. This too distinguishes the biblical monotheism from the normal religions surrounding ancient Middle East. Now, Asman's term for this is, as we know, the Mosaic distinction. Here, the distinction, true-false, which was already uh, in Akinetan's monotheism, is directly connected to the social and the political law. The truth criterion is linked with and central within the law as revealed by God to Moses on the Mount Sinai and written down in the first five books of the Bible. This connection, together with the truth criterion, since the, Akhenaton, uh, since the atom monotheism has been destroyed after Kinetan's death, has no equivalent in the religions of the surrounding world. Jewish monotheism is much younger than Akhenaton's and is not the result of a proclaimed revolution but of an age-long process. Maybe the religious culture under King David and Solomon 
uh, was centered around something as one God, but it was certainly not the monotheism the, of the Mosaic distinction. In a way, the monotheism that constitutes the base for today's religions of that name is no, no, not older than the 6th century before Christ. <coughs> Only in the period during and after the Babylonian, the Babylonian captivity, the religion of Abraham's descendants, or exactly of what was left of them, has been reformed and restyled in the sense of what we now know as Jewish religion. In that period, both state and culture of Israel were on the verge of being definitely destroyed. More exactly, Israel, which is the name for the northern part of David's and Solomon's kingdom, that formed a separate state of ten tribes, among a totality of twelve, was already destroyed totally as the result of the Assyrian captivity in 70, uh, 721. The southern part, the remaining two tribes of the area of Jerusalem, among which the tribe of Judah, who gave the name of that little kingdom, hence the Jews, was victim of a collective devastation in 586, this time by the Babylonians. During the Babylonian captivity, when, and now I quote, Psalm 137, when by the rivers of Babylon we sat down and wept, the Jews filtered their tradition into a new, restyled religion. That's the origin of our monotheism. There it is. Not Akhenaten. There it is. The 6th century before Christ. Not earlier. That, that restyling has given that, that uh, monotheism that is still influential today. It was then they remembered the kind of religious spokesman called the prophets who did not play up to the king and the ruling class and had defined the land of promise not as a matter of national power but as a matter of justice done to the widow and the orphan. Within religion, these prophets had moved the emphasis from the commerce with the divine to the domain of the social relation among people. A land of promise is a land of social justice. Wherever that land is, wherever that people is. The desacralization and the ethization, so to speak, the becoming ethical of that religion, as proposed by prophets Isaiah, Jeremiah, Hosea, Amos, and so on, was more than welcome to the people in exile in Babylon. It was then they remembered it. We should, we should have listened to, to those prophets, to those um, spokesmen of the divine, centuries ago, then we should understand what it is to be the inheritors of the land of promise. Now they understood how right those prophets were and how, even far away from home, they are able to do what God wanted them to do in the quality of his chosen people, the people of the covenant. Where is the revolution in all this? First of all, in the fact that a religion came into being which, compared to the others, was radically different. A deep sacralized religion, putting the emphasis not on the divine, but on, but on human affairs, on the ethical, social justice. But that religion was revolution, re revolutionary in yet another way, more precisely in the way it was still a religion, more specifically a monotheistic religion. And here we meet the kernel, the revolutionary kernel of monotheism, monotheism we are dealing with nowadays. <coughs> and now I, I evoke what monotheism is about. Do not like, do, do not like others, do not cling to their gods. Your God has forbidden you to worship other gods. For you, those gods are false or, or general. Nothing is what you think God is. Nothing, nothing of what you think God is, is God, for only God is God. In the core of monotheism, there is a strong dimension of religion critique, and even theoclasm, not even iconoclasm, theoclasm. The kernel of monotheism is the, the putting away of the, even of the idea of God, the theos. Worshipping God is, first of all, dis distrusting all other gods and criticizing things people are inclined to worship 
as God or godly. On its most fundamental level, monotheism's practice coincides with unmasking false God, without being able to really know or appropriate its own one and true God. Living the trust in the one true God concurs with the never ceasing criticism against possible false God. Worshipping the one God goes hand in hand with the permanent will to revolution. With the inexhaustible readiness at any time to unmask one's and others spontaneous religiosity and to destroy the false god or gods one holds for true. We do not know. We do not know to what precise extent that this, that this has given rise to a real revolution in history. But at least the biblical text mentions an age of general theoclast uprising. It is the so-called reform of Josiah. A report on, uh, as reported in the Bible, uh, the second book, Kings 21-23. Um, and it's the story, and I, I skip this too, to, to have more time maybe for the discussion, it's the story really when they refound, so-called, it, it, it's the way they, they shaped the, the, the restyling of their tradition, as I, as I mentioned. In the myth that they found, they refound the book of the law. In Jerusalem, and the Joshua is the king. Joshua, it's read that book. He's weeping. He, he tore his clothes, and he says, "We were wrong, and we have to go now straight on to the right way." Which means we have to destroy all religion. So, so the field class is there. In the, you should read those two chapters. Wonderful they are. But really think, read them, and think on the Talmuds who are destroying the. The, the, the wonderful Buddhist uh, statues in Afghanistan. That, that, that's the, the origin, the revolutionary origin, and the revolutionary curve of monotheism. To believe in God and to destroy gods. That, that's what I, what I mentioned here. And that, 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 that's why we, we are the result of a revolution and we cannot really deal with that revolution. There, there's, in, 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 in the deep kernel of our culture, there is something we are fighting with. And we, we have to reflect on, on religion to, to clarify that a little bit. But so, that's, that's your personal reading, 2 Kings 22-23. Um, the, the core of, the core of the, that ancient Jewish monotheism was, as I just explained, was revolutionary criticism, even religion criticism. Here we face the inherently paradoxical core of monotheism which states that the only just way to be religious is to distrust religion. So the way to be religious is distrust religion. And even to distrust the alternatives for religion, which might be uh, suspiciously religious as well. Monotheism's core is religion critique remaining nonetheless within the boundaries of religion. It's truly really a paradox. I criticize religion, and a distrust religion. This paradox is all over the biblical text, but nowhere is it more clearly expressed than in that other famous book, the book of Job. I skipped again the evocation of the book of Job, and you, you, you all know that. And I, I go to the remarks about it. Uh, let me see. So, um, of course, Finally, all ends well in the book of Job, of Bob, of, of Job uh, but the body of the book, um, um, 34 chapters on 42, uh, present Job's doubt with respect to God and his justice. But the entire book is filled with the question whether monotheist religion makes any sense at all. That's the core of that book. The core of the book is the question, does it make sense to believe, to have worship to that God? Um, and the answer, the answer given at the end, is not really convincing. If only because it is just repeating 
the, the, this religion is basic dogmas. The emphasis on the question rather than on the answer is paradigmatic for Jewish monotheism. It is a religion consisting in questioning the very reason why one should trust God and his law. And even if at the end the answer is always positive, positive, the core of what is said remains a question, a hard, persistent question, never really neutralized by any given answer. This is monotheism. The religious insight that even religion is a way to deny that only God is God. This is why, in God's very name, one must never stop questioning the idea one has about God. For no other than religious reasons, one must inconsiderately question his religion. It is the core, it is the core of the Book of Job and of the whole monotheistic religion. Let me jump in time and refer to Judaism's most important collective experience of the last century, the Shoah. From a religious perspective, this tremendous catastrophe has raised an abysmal question. Where was God in Auschwitz? Where was the God when his chosen people, the people of his covenant, became the victim of the greatest genocide in history? What is the sense of the law promising, the law, the capital, the, the law of the covenant, promising prosperity and justice for the widow and the orphan, when the people observing that law has been tortured for centuries by evil pogroms to be finally led to death en masse in the, na the, the Nazi gas chambers? It's an abysmal question, repeated in countless variations by the 20th century thinkers and writers, and to which the Jewish religion had, and still has, no answer. Yet, Judaic, uh, Judaic religion has survived the Shoah. During the decennia after the Second World War, it even has seen a general revival. Why then, the question where God was in Auschwitz has not had the contrary effect on the history of that religion. Is it because the Jewish people had found again their fate in the God of Abraham, Isaac and Jacob? But how then did they rediscover it if Auschwitz shows God's terrible absence and even the failure of the Jewish religion's basic dogma? Or, to, to put it in another word, the basic phantasm of, um, of monotheism. It means the idea that the law is the way to happiness and prosperity. So, something else must have given ground to Judaism's revival after the Shoah. What if the Shoah repeats, be it in a horrible way, the very essence of Judaic monotheism? An essence which is not to be defined as faith or belief, but as a question, a hard critical question. Indeed, the Shoah calls the very core of Judaic religion into question and suggests the possibility that it might be built on a mere illusion. But is that question not the very core of Judaic monotheism? Was this question not central in the very origin of monotheism when, weeping by the rivers of Babylon, the remnant tribes of Israel faced the possibility of the definite destruction? And was this not the same question, be it in a more abstract way, raised in the book of Job? This is perhaps the core of Judaic monotheism. Rather than trust, faith and belief in one God, which in a way it certainly is, but it is, it is more than that, it is a culture of non-trust, of consequent non-trust. A culture of questioning the divine gods or God in which we are inclined to lay down our trust. Judaic monotheism is the culture, not so much of our faith in God, but of questioning God. God is in its center, but as a question. From a Judaic monotheistic perspective, God is not the one whom we can establish a religious economy relation with. He is beyond any religious economy relation, economic relation, which means we should distrust and proclaim God and switch, in the name of God, our attention 
to the justice among mortal humans, or to put it in a different way, to the justice to our mortal fellows. We constantly should question to do, in order to do justice to our mortal fellows, we constantly should question the dreams about gods we cannot but cherish. This is why in Auschwitz, God's absence was not the final argument against Jewish monotheism. That absence is rem um, rememorized in the shape of an abysmal question containing an, an unscrupulous accusation of God, of the idea we have of God, a question the very tradition of that religion is rooted in. And in that quality, it was a question attacking also the gods, idols, Nazi Europe had faith in. It was an attack on faith in a certain way. <coughs> in one of his novels, Eli Wiesel tells the story, a well-known story, about some rabbis in Auschwitz who, one day, took the matter of their god into court. They just played a play. <coughs> They accused God of having neglected the covenant he had established with, uh, with his chosen people and organized a trial, figuring a judge, a public prosecutor, and at least witnesses for the persecution and witnesses for the defense. All parties were given ample time and at the end, and the, at the end judgment was given. God was found guilty of mass murder and sentenced to death. Yet, once the judgments passed, the head of the court did as if he looked on his watch, on his watch, his prison had no watch, said, oh, oh, and said to the gathered prisoners around him, something like that, so, well done, and now it is time for the evening prayer. It's typically, you know, it's, uh, Eloise, I think, in, in, in La Nuit, he's, uh, he's telling that story. The last remark is crucial. Even if God is found guilty of violating his own covenant, the religion around that God goes on. So, so again, I don't know what it is, but what, what is religion here? You know, you know, it's really a question. God is not so much the center of hope as the center of critical questioning, including questioning God and his existence. We certainly have not fully understood what it means to have religion critique in the very heart of a religion. It is similar to another situation, just as little understood, namely that nowadays we have to criticize ideology, being at the same time aware that there is no outside of ideology. Within a universe where ideology dominates, for instance by means of the well-spread idea that ideologies are over and that they are dead. So, within a universe where ideology dominates and certainly will keep on dominating, we have to keep on criticizing it. That's our situation, mirroring the situation of our ideology critique into the critique which constitutes the heart of monotheism, we perhaps may learn a lot. But again, where is the revolution in all this? For criticism does not necessarily imply a call on revolution. Interpreting the question of God in Auschwitz as referring to the critical core of monotheism may have something revolutionary but history made clear that no revolution came out of it. The real revolutionary potential of monotheism is due to one of its phantasms appearing relatively late in its history. The phantasm of God's law, this means the idea that man could restore the broken relation to God by observing his covenant commandments, in a sense admitted its failure in the book of Job supposedly written in the 4th century before Christ. There, it was made clear that obeying God's law, doing justice to the poor and the fatherless, does not imply a guarantee for the promises made by God concerning his law. A couple of centuries later, in the 2nd century before Christ, a new phantasm emerged within Judaic monotheism. It is, it is the phantasm that God will end his creation of the eschaton, in order to fully reveal his truth, which has never been understood really, that's the apocalypse, apocalypse, revealing, through the Messiah, that's the messianism, that's the kind of, of the, the, the new phantasms, apocalyptical, eschatological messianism. 
It is the messianic phantasm sustained by the eschatological, apocalyptical one. From this point of view, everything is under apocalyptic reservation. Nothing can claim to have appropriated the fullness of truth, for that truth still has to come. This phantasm, this new structure, this new paradigm, provides, this new myth in the religion, provides a very strong critical position in monotheism. Putting, indeed, every human truth claim under radical reservation. However, this does not go without reintroducing a dangerous quantum of religion into the monotheistic religion critique. And I only will work it out very briefly, but that, 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 that should be worked out, because that, that's our problem. <coughs> For this phantasm supposes the possibility of an anticipatory access to the fully revealed apocalyptic truth, to an eschatological truth beyond time and death. So it, 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 it's on the verge to reinstall a commerce with a God, within monotheism, who doesn't stand it. The godly truth involved is no longer a merely critical point, putting every truth claim under reservation. Again, a relation is established with the godly truth making someone able to appropriate that divine truth, to speak in its name without restraint. Add to this the Platonic, and here comes philosophy in, add to this the Platonist belief in an afterlife, which is absent in the original uh, monotheism, add to this the Platonist belief in an afterlife, in a perfect reality beyond the mortal transient one, and you have an excellent disposition enabling one to see in the destruction of the world the sign of the establishing of a perfect world to come. The formal disposition is at work in any kind, this formal disposition is at work in any kind of revolution, up till now, including the ones modernity has known and is the result of. That disposition so to see in the destruction already the society to come, it combines its destructive and its constructive side in a way which is virtuously catastrophic. For this combination is made not in reality, but anticipatorily. And here religion in the ancient sense comes in. This combination is made not in reality, but anticipatorily, in a dreamed world. Any destruction within the existing world is already a sign, if not an effectuation, of a new world to come. Put in religious monotheistic terms, the obliteration of the false gods is already the way of worshipping the one and true God. That's my point. Monotheism is violent in its core, because you only can venerate God by destroying false gods. That's, that's, that, that's why the destruction of gods is the essence of the, the trust, if you may call that, in one God. Um, let me see. And it is, um, excuse me, put in, put in religious monotheistic terms, the obliteration of the false god is already the way of worshipping the one and true God. And, as already mentioned, the crucial question here is whether an alternative way of worshipping the monotheist God is possible at all. Since the core of monotheism is critical, what else can, we, what else can my fidelity to the one God mean than a constant and persistent skepticism with regard to that what people, including myself, think God is? But again back, in reference to the situation real revolutions are in, what else can the establishing of a revolutionary society mean than to persist in the destruction of the old society? This may be the reason why revolutions are often so cruel and, as we know, eat its own children and keep on eating their own children. To preserve the critical power they originate in, they must continue to hunt down the false revolutionaries, the false ideas 
and the ancient idols. And most evolutions never succeeded in overcome that hunt, as history time and again has shown. My point is not that a different attitude in revolution is not possible at all. Yet, if we interrogate the relation between religion and revolution, as it has become a part of the current political scene, we have to be aware of this kind of disposition originating in monotheism, more precisely in today's dominant apocalyptical and eschatological monotheisms, Christianity and Islam. The apocalyptical and eschatological gaze of, for instance, the suicide bomber walking to the streets of Baghdad before it goes into action, interprets the destruction of the city and its citizens, including the victims he is about to make, as a sign of the world to come, and even as an effectuation of the world to come. This is the world to come. That is that what gives life. That, that the Christian resurrection. What I want to say is there's, there's a core of extreme perversity in it. And, and, and we're all dealing with it. If you believe or not in Christianity, we, all, we have to deal with that. Or exactly, he confuses the sign with that of which it is supposed to be a sign, since he supposes to live already in that world to come, and the world revealing the final truth, apocalypse, a truth which is no longer characterized by time and death, which is the myth of the eschaton. Here, criticism has lost any self-reflection, any autocriticism. The kind of criticism, this kind of criticism, is most apt to revolution, but it is at the same time the, dispos the disposition for revolutions, for the revolution's totalitarian turn. A last brief remark which, which has to be worked out about Christianity, based on apocalyptic eschatological messianic phantasm inherited from Christian monotheism, any modern revolution has the difficulty to manage its revolutionary force. Also, here we have a management, management problem. How can a revolution manage its, 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 its critical core? This is due to the inherently double-bind condition of the messianic phantasm. On the one hand, it enables a radical criticism towards the existing society, as well as a possibility to create a radical new one. On the other hand, however, it prohibits that new society to have a critical view on itself. It more precisely forbids to have a future, or, so to say, to have a to-come dimension. A messianic society is obliged to suppose itself to be beyond any possible criticism, and thus to oppress all criticism. Christianity has discovered an almost perfect a little bit perfect in a perverse way to deal with that double bind structure. On the one hand, it confesses to live already in the apocalyptic, eschatological, messianic realm, sharing the resurrected state of the Christ who has overcome sin, time, and death. This is why it is able to claim the fullness of truth, apocalypse. Yet, once attacked for that, once attacked for therefore being too pretentious, it can, at the other hand, draw another card and say that no one can claim the fullness of truth since the Messiah still had not come. Christ has still to come back from his Father, I quote, and only then he shall judge by uh, the living and the dead. So Christianity can really, and that, that's the perversity of Christianity, have a double bind relation. It can say, the Messiah will come, and so no one has the truth, and say at the same time, we have the truth, because the Messiah is ours. I think, it, I was already on the train by writing that here, so if to work it out, when, when, when one should say that, that what modernity has inherited from Christianity is not a myth, we don't believe in the, in the Virgin Mother. We, we think we are more intelligent than that. Which is a bit stupid. Because what we have inherited is that structure of double bind. That structure of being at the same time 
relatively aware of the fact that nobody has the truth, but at the same time, even that sentence is, is, is claiming the position of the absolute truth. So, to end my talk here, we are still within Hegel, within the absolute knowledge. The absolute knowledge, the end of Hegel's from the disguise, is, that's our problem. We, precisely by thinking we can, uh, we can have a relative view on the world, we have installed the most absolute view on the world there is. And that's our problem, and we have to, to go back to the messianic phantasm of Christianity and monotheism to, to clarify that a little bit. Thank you. Analysis, um, you kind of yeah, show the notion of religion is a very kind of infectious thing, you know, it encompasses everything. Yeah, well, it's a, it's a more <laughs> than what what would not be actually religion. If, if religion and monotheism overlaps with the social, then uh, is there anything like nowadays even outside that kind of definition? Because also ideology is religion, and you know, religion so on and so forth. Well, it's, a, it's not a simple question, it's a difficult question, because indeed, starting from antiquity, and starting from an anthropological, uh, historical view, religion is first, and there was once, not, not an outsider of religion. But to mention Marcel Gaucher, who said that already in, in their ancient religions, there's kind of la sortie de la religion, kind of coming, leaving that, that, that religion. So in a certain way, what is not religion? Modernity is not religion. We, we have no, no, no religious way of living. That's why I had to say at the beginning of my talk that we don't know really what religion is. But we, we are now in the middle of it, leaving that religion, because the, the way out of that religion is monotheism. And monotheism has a double bind relation with religion in a certain way. It is a critique on religion, but within the within the boundaries of religion. So, I, I cannot say what is... The, the fact is, to be without religion is in a certain way the dream of monotheism. To be without God is the dream of the monotheistic relation to God. The, the, the entire mysticism is about that. To go on the, on, the, on the Mount Carmel and finally to have nothing. Nada, 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 y nada. That's, that's the St. John of the, of the Cross, his, his ideal. That's God. But that, that's an ideal. So the most difficult thing in Western modern culture is atheism. That's difficult. And this is in the kernel of monotheism. Because that, read the mystics, go to Gebrücken, or to, 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 to refer to, uh, to Rusbrook, when you enjoy God, you enjoy nothing. Or you are in the Kenyan enjoyment. It's a, it's a wonderful ruin. <laughs>